So uh, while, while the Commissioner was speaking, I was uh, thinking about uh, the intrinsic motivation, some of the work we've done in companies. Um, I spoke about Zappos earlier today, and that company actually give uh, uh, food for all their staff, and free of charge. And with those values and the purpose of the organization, they have this trust process. And over the last 10 years, they've not had one person steal food from the organization. Kind of interesting. The other thing we did was I'm working with Dan Pink and uh, did a, a program on National Geographic. And you've seen, the, you've seen the disabled parking signs, you know, where they're 200 bucks, right? So we put up uh, hidden cameras in a shopping mall in Washington, DC. All day, people went in and parked in the disabled, you know, able-bodied people went in and parked. So what we did overnight was we took a photo of these people that use the car parks and we put a sign, think of me, keep it free. What do you think happened the next day? No one parked in it. There was this appeal and sense to purpose. But is that, has that gone funny? Um, so I want, to, I want to tell you another little story uh, uh, in terms of integrity. I, I was actually asked um, by the US government, um, signed a contract, US government, to go to Hawaii. I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I get to do a gig in Hawaii. And uh, I was to meet all the government officials the night before. And I was sitting down and we were having a beautiful dinner. And I discovered that I was working the next day and three days afterwards with the National Security Association. So the NSA. Um, it also happened to be three months after a guy, I don't know whether you heard of this guy, Edward Snowden. So it was three months after uh, working with Edward Snowden, uh, after he uh, had, had done uh, his misdemeanors. And the commanding officer was really concerned about uh, the integrity of the organization. But one of the things he said to me is he said, you know, I know you're doing all this work with Dan Pink. Um, what you don't need to do is... A Keep going. <laughs> what, what, what I don't need to do is... I hope you haven't destroyed that. <laughs> I need it. Um, but what, what, what I don't want you to do is to... Um, Talk to us tomorrow about purpose. You know, we, re we really know what we're on about. And I said, well, that's really going to muck up my whole day tomorrow because the whole talk is about purpose. And so I went in there and, and uh, I did start giving my spiel around purpose. And the commanding officer um, actually stood up and apologized and said, look, I, I think I've got this really wrong because um, what, what we have is a vision. And we're very, very clear on our vision. And the vision is the statement of what you want to become. And you remember early in the day I talked about we're good at telling people what to do and how to do it? Um, the very, also very, very good in terms of um, the mission, you know, how they're going to achieve it. But what we really, what they, <laughs> am I controlling this or you? <laughs> Sorry? Really? Cool. <laughs> um, but what we really want to do is um, f you know, focus on the purpose piece and the why. And I think if I go back to what I was just talking about with the disabled car park, we really need to tap into a sense of emotion and it needs to be really short and sweet, the purpose. So making South Australia thrive, I think, is fabulous. But in each of your organization, you need to understand what is your why sentence. So um, I'm going to show you this little video clip, and I'm going to ask you to do a little activity for me. We like to get purpose statements down to six words. Six words and evoke some emotion. And um, I, I, I reconnected with Linda before. Uh, I worked at the Repat Hospital 20 years ago and when, went from the Commonwealth to the South Australian government. The purpose statement was um, the best hospital in Australia for older people. Do you remember that? Every decision that was made was, does this make that hospital the best hospital in Australia for older people? Does that make sense? It's very clear. Every decision. So I'm going to show you this little video around the six-word sentence, and then I'm going to give you four minutes to come up with three purpose statements. The first is 
the purpose statement for your organization, department, why do you exist? A why statement for your team, why does your team exist? And a purpose statement for yourself. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna show you this video, I'm gonna give you four minutes to come up with those three purpose statements. Legend has it, Hemingway was once challenged to write a novel in just six words. His response? For sale, baby shoes never worn. Smith Magazine decided to give the six-word form a personal twist, challenging its readers to write a six-word memoir. Hundreds of thousands did. It only works if it's personal. Remember, it's a memoir. The story should be specific to your life. Limitations force you to be creative. Write a great memoir because of the six-word parameter, not in spite of it. Get inspired from reading other memoirs. Great ones can be found in these books. Like any other story, make revisions. Put the six best words in the best order. Publish your story to inspire others. You can submit instantly on smithmag.net and be considered for the next book. Everyone has a story. What's yours? So you understand the, what you've got to do? So four minutes, why your department exists? Well, you, everyone's complaining about four minutes. You work there, you must know it. Four minutes, why, why does your department exist? Why? Why does your team exist? Why do you do what you do? And your own purpose statement. Ready, set, go. Depends on how close. Right. <laughs> that mightn't be as helpful then, might it? <laughs> which, was, which, which was the hardest one to do, by the way? The, the department, team, or personal? Come on, folks, give me some feedback. The personal was the most difficult? Aren't you the CEO of your own life? <laughs> shouldn't, it be, shouldn't it be the easiest, though? Is that reality? Yep. What else? Give me some other feedback. How did you find that? Yes, sir. Is difficult? Yep. So, so the reason we do this, though, is that people don't remember. We go into so many organizations which have these big purpose statements and, and 20 different values, and no one ever remembers them. And so back to, back to the NSA, what they did every day, the commanding officer went out and met with the troops every day, said, why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? And there's nothing more demotivating than not seeing the, you know, the reality of your work as well. True? So as leaders, we have to be able to get this purpose statement um, down pat so it's, um, re you know, people can remember it and it also is emotional. Um, General Electric are a really interesting company, by the way. Do you know the company General Electric, one of the biggest companies in the world? By the way, does anyone know who founded General Electric? Jack Welsh. No, he was the CEO in about 1990. This company's like 120 years old. Anyone else? Anyone have heard of a guy by the name of Thomas Edison? Thomas Edison. Anyway, so they, they were a huge company, lots of mergers and acquisitions, and so the, they have spent a lot of time around purpose on why people do what they do. They have a lot of people, engineers, welders, um, you know, electricians, etc. Here's a little video clip of, um, that they put together so that people could see on a daily basis of why they do what they do. Really interesting. Our machines help identify early stages of cancer, and it's something that we're extremely proud of. And to have that special equipment be able to look inside you and find these kind of things early is pretty special. When somebody finds out that they're healthy, then now they have the rest of their life, that's incredible. You can develop something, you can engineer something that will help people realize that. Unbelievable. I wouldn't do anything else. If you see someone who's saved because of this technology, you know that things that you do in your life matter. 
if I did have an opportunity to meet a cancer survivor, I'm sure their outlook on life would be a lot different, and I'm sure I could take something positive away from that. My name is Jocelyn, and I'm a cancer survivor. I had cancer. I have no evidence of disease now. Today, I am cancer-free for five years. Surviving cancer is early detection. That technology is directly responsible for us detecting it while it was in such an early stage that we were able to deal with it successfully. I'm eternally grateful to the people that developed that technology. I would love to meet the people that made the machines. I had such an amazing group of doctors and nurses, and it would just make such a complete picture of why I'm sitting here today. If I were to meet the people at GE that created this technology for the scanning equipment, I would thank them and explain to them, you know, the work that they're doing is wonderful. Look what the end result is. I'm here, I'm with my family, uh, I'm with my friends, and I'm able to continue my life. The experience meeting them was, it's hard to really put into words. They were so warm and welcoming. They were all equally as genuine and, and really inspirational. They were saying that it really gave their work meaning. From the moment we walked in the front door to the love that they were showing just to see me, not as a cancer patient, but as a person that had been helped by their work and the technology and their brilliance and what they do, I was just blown away. One of the most heartwarming events that I've ever experienced. I feel like one of the luckiest guys in the world. I feel very blessed. Every organization I've worked in that is highly successful has absolutely nailed its purpose statement and appealed to a sense of purpose for everyone in their organization. And I think it's very important as senior leaders in the public sector to look at purpose around the goals, words, and policies that you use in your organization. So a lot of managers, leaders, use words like this when they talk to the troops. You know, they have a town hall meeting. They talk about efficiency, effectiveness, uh, the budget, value, superiority, differentiation. But as George was saying in, in his talk earlier, when, when, when you appeal to everyone and say, what does this organization mean to you? I think you get something completely different. These things don't get people out of bed. Well, maybe the finance people, but they, they, they don't get people out of bed at 6 a.m. on a cold Adelaide morning. And I used to love, for, for what it's worth, I used to love watching a, a video of Steve Jobs where he was talking about the calligraphy class that he um, went to. And he, did, and he used words about love and justice and truth and beauty. And these are the kind of things that get people out of bed in the morning, you know? So again, I live near Disney. I mean, people, those 80,000 people work there every day, just one mile from my house. And they love it there. They absolutely love it. By the way, I ask this question around the world. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand up if you've done this and keep your hand up because I've got a follow-up question. Who's ever bought an Apple product? iPad, iPhone, whatever. Keep your hand up, right? Keep your hand up if you kept the packaging. Why? Why do you keep the packaging? <laughs> Tell me, why do you keep the packaging? And it's not to resell it, is it? It's beautiful, isn't it? It's beautiful. I, mean, I, I literally still have, when, when I moved to the US, I, uh, out north, I actually have a shipping container. I have a filing cabinet with three drawers full of empty packaging from Apple. I haven't been here for three and a half years. I mean, this is ridiculous. But, but isn't that incredible? Because Apple are just another computer company, aren't they? They, do, they, they, they appeal. They put a ding in the universe. I and mean, that's why we don't buy songs from other stores. You know, they make things easy for us, and they appeal to the sense of purpose. So um, very interesting. This, by the way, same all around the world. 80% of people keep the packaging. Very interesting, though. Um, the other thing around policies, um, 
we, when I was in government, we had so many policies, it was unbelievable. In fact, the only time we ever used those policies, though, was when something went wrong, right? And, and so it was really interesting listening to the commissioner's talk. Um, the, any, anyone heard of this little company called Netflix, by the way? Netflix? Um, this is their policy for expenses now. That's their whole policy for expenses. It comes back to a judgment call. So if they're in Los Angeles and they're taking Ricky Gervais out for a movie, right, and they spend $3,500 on lunch, do you think that's probably in Netflix's best interest? Probably, right, the $3,500. If they were taking me out for lunch, maybe not. But um, you know, so, so again, appeal to purpose. We've got to make sure that our policies with people um, appeal to that purpose and appeal to the values that people remember them. What is the right thing to do? Um, and I've got to tell you, we, we, the other thing that I've been doing in the US is working with a guy by the name of Sean Acor on the happiness advantage and looking at routines and, and uh, um, purpose. And we are now working in Chicago in the public education sector one school district, two and a half thousand teachers, uh, 16,000 kids. And we've been really working on the purpose piece for the school, um, been doing positive psychology and um, talking to the kids about why they do what they do. Why do they do math? Why do they do science? Why do they do all these things? Um, in this school district, they had enormous problems with mental health issues, depression, anxiety and behaviour issues. And the school reported to us, in the last three months, they have not had one behaviour issue from the kids by doing this purpose piece. Not one. And I think that's really interesting. When you appeal to a sense of purpose, what you can do. So I'm going to conclude now. We're going to have a QA, and a I think, in a minute. Um, but your job as leaders is to express the purpose. Um, what are we here to do for our co-workers? What are we here for our customers? What are we here in society to do and to assist the government with. And that all comes back to purpose. And um, I think if we, can, if we can appeal to that, and if you can get something very short and very emotional, um, people will want to contribute to something that matters rather than seeing themselves financially invested and wanting return. They'll really contribute on a daily basis and do great things. And uh, I think Emma will hand over to you, yeah? That's right, clap. <laughs> um, look, we've got probably about five to ten minutes um, of questions. Um, we've got some roving microphones, so you, uh, we've got the three speakers here. Um, please, I'm sure someone's got a question. Oh, here we go. Thank, thank you. And some others start thinking about a question. So over to Gabby. Um, I wanted to know... How many red socks did you find? Because we've got more than one. You got a whole, you've probably got a whole washing load. No. <laughs> yeah, so um, the, I think the, I, I probably found three or four myself that I had to deal with at the senior executive level, but I'm talking six or seven years. But I think the real power was that when the organisation saw that the leadership was serious about alignment with values, and you couldn't condone um, corrosive behaviour that was in conflict with those values, then the Red Sox were found down the organisation by the appropriate supervisory layers that we gave them permission to be aligned with our values. Can I just add that, um, just on that, the Zappos as an organisation, they won't recruit, from, from the time of a position, they will not put someone in the job for 90 days. So they take 90 days and they employ them based on values and purpose. And then when they do join the organisation, four weeks they have to do training, including at the call centre, two weeks. And then they have a graduation. On the graduation, they offer them $5,000 to leave that day. $5,000. So I think recruiting to culture is really, really uh, critical. Which then leads us to actually articulating sort of our organisational kind of capabilities or leadership. 
um, capabilities rather than sort of that technical expertise if you're leading and managing people. Um, I'd like to uh, a question to you, Bruce, in terms of um, uh, you mentioned sort of systemic kind of issues, maybe condoning behaviours in organisations and sort of that, that issue of culture. Um, is there anything particular, without giving much away, that surprised you about how that could continue over a period? You mentioned something about um, your surprise at how some of that um, just continues. Is it because um, leaders don't know what to do about the behaviour or they've allowed it to continue? I mean, what's your sort of take on why that just continues to happen in some circumstances? It, it's, it's not altogether um, clear um, as to why the uh, conduct is allowed to um, continue, but I, I think um, in many um, of the agencies, um, the leadership um, um, is not well enough aware of um, the way in which uh, the employees go about their business. Um, I don't think they... Um, properly supervise um, some of the uh, people within the department. I think um, what we've noticed is that there was almost a, an ability to casually commit crime within uh, the departments because uh, the leadership is not strong enough in relation to that. Um, and it's a, it's a matter of some concern. Um, I, I think we all ought to um, reconsider our positions as to the way in which we create our policies, as, as just been mentioned, you can have too many policies, of course, so that uh, the policies policies are such that they overwhelm the um, uh, the number of employees. And the, uh, but what we need are, are clear, concise policies, uh, which are well understood, as I said earlier, are well understood by the employees, and uh, and must be adhered to. And I, I think that more efforts being made into creating policies rather than have the policies um, uh, effective and uh, adhered to. Mm, thank you for that. And I was actually having a conversation in the uh, morning tea break about um, uh, not only, um, and I'm in the process of, of, of reviewing things like guidelines and determinations, they can often be in conflict with what other agencies have in their own organisations. So not only have we got layers of policies, but we ha then have conflict and confusion within the same sort of public authority about what's the right thing to do and often that customer practice is occurring. We can't underestimate or underscore the importance of leadership and also reconciling those policies to make them simpler and people clear about what their responsibilities are. I have a question over here. Hi, Donna Stevens. And just leading on from what um, Bruce had just said, um, I, think, I think that is true to have policies that are better understood. I think the difficulty is that a lot of people at the operational level do very much value that and try and keep in line with those principles, but then you have the Red Sox who get in the way of, uh, you know, we have this culture still, unfortunately, that he who shouts aloud us will get what they want. And I think it's very difficult because, you know, a lot of people invest time in trying to do the best thing and create a change in culture. Um, and I think in health there are a lot of people who are very willing to, to change that culture and to be part of a, a, a new generation that um, are you know, more open to different ways of working and valuing and leading with purpose and value. But I think that's very difficult because you know, senior leadership is not consistent and it makes it very, very difficult to, to make those things come to fruition. So it's really exciting to have forums like this to have that opportunity um, and I've, I, I really welcome it from, from a health perspective where it's so chaotic at the moment um, but hopefully we can learn to build that culture mm. together. Thank well thank you. you for sharing that um, and I think uh, we certainly will continue on the path of actually supporting people in their role as leaders but more importantly um, a lot of the things that we've done is about a puzzle being put together here. It's not um, by mistake that we're actually also implementing performance management. Um, it's not, you know, the, the fact that we're talking about values and behaviours um, and purpose uh, comes first because you can't be talking to someone about why they're there if they're, they're not sure themselves um, and what you expect of them. So it's not just what they're doing, but it's how they're actually doing it. And it's not by mistake that we've got a leadership academy being launched because you've got to 
pick the best people with the right sort of skills to be those future leaders. And I suspect because you're in the room, you are those future leaders as well, or you'll go back and actually ensure that that's occurring. So um, it is actually putting that sort of leadership puzzle together uh, for the state public service, the largest employer in South Australia. So each of these areas are very important. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I wondered how Medibank went about harnessing the ideas from the ground floor people to get the efficiencies that you found? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I didn't know anything about insurance when I joined the board. I was there as a governance person. Um, so all I did was stay with my toolbox as an industrial engineer. So I set up a series of quality action teams across the company when I went to everyone and said, look, we're in trouble. We're, we're, we're making a lot of losses and we're getting close to prudential breach. Um, and so the quality action teams were designed to um, be across departments in geographic locations and probably no larger than what you could fit around this table, one of your tables, maybe a little bit bigger. And then they would identify five or six things that don't really work very well and then pick on the top two and then work through a sort of a get it 80% right, send it up and let's get it approved. And then I had to make sure that the managers were engaged because if you send it up and nobody's reading and listening, then it really puts everyone off. So that's where I found some red socks in that middle layer. Yep. Um, but then we celebrated success. We got the teams to come and present. I actually, they presented to our board. Um, you know, got to keep the board busy. So um, when they came, you know, these are frontline retail staff or branch claims staff, and they were very nervous to stand in front of the board of directors. And we sort of gave them some practice sessions helped them get the slides together. They'd come in with a sort of shaky knees and do the presentation. Uh, we had board members in tears because they so loved the passion of employees wanting to make their company better and finding better ways to improve. So it was a real power play. Got everyone engaged, lots of energy. Thank you. We've got time for one more question, if there is anyone who's... No? All right. Please join me in thanking our speakers uh, today once again, Andrew, George and Bruce. I certainly found it very interesting beginning conversation um, about how we do this across the sector. In lieu of speaker gifts today, IPA will make a small donation to Andrew Greatrex's charity of choice, which is Julian, Burns, Julian Burton Burns Trust, so I thank you uh, on their behalf. I'd like to thank the staff of my office for the public sector who spent a lot of time pulling this together and of course the IPA staff who do fantastic um, event management here. So thank you for the collaboration to bring this event today. We're going to have many more of these um, as we uh, continue this journey. Um, I'd also like to thank the Purpose and Values and Wellbeing Reference Groups. We have our own reference group, George, um, and it's good that some people introduce themselves and are very excited about being part of that journey. So that's us actually taking charge of our own destiny as well. And I thank all the leaders in particular here that are embedding the public sector values in their agencies. Just want to talk a bit about next steps. So we might have had a good conversation today. We walk out here today and um, good uh, thought process, but we need to do more now. We need to actually embed those purpose, purpose and values with the 25,000 or so middle managers that, that run really uh, the public service and help support those people delivering the services. So we will run a series of practical workshops longer than this um, that will actually commence managers and leaders in the process of how they do that with their work groups, how they have these sorts of conversations, how they embed it in their performance management processes. So following today, you'll receive a link to the Modern Manager series, Leading with Purpose, Living Our Values. Can I suggest we have about 40 places that you try and get as many leaders or your middle managers in those sessions as possible. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, we have an e-thanks on our uh, values website. Um, as leaders, this provides you with the opportunity to recognise those people who are living our values in the work that they do. And recognition in the moment can often motivate people beyond what we believe it does. Today, we'd like your feedback. So you're going to get a, um, a forum feedback form from IPA. I'd like you to complete that so we can always improve the sessions that you come to um, through our office and IPA. And finally, I continue to be proud each day and every day of the work we do as public servants. And I want to thank you for your contribution. 
Travel always with the public sector values, with courage, tenacity, professionalism and integrity. I know it isn't always easy and judgment can often be difficult, but it is essential. And if you do this, you'll always have my support. Thank you.